Sudan and bring into the conversation the third of MP and Foreign Secretary James Cleverly. Thank you for coming on now. All too often uh, in this item, I seem to go after various government ministers or cabinet secretaries and tell them that they've not done well. But I have to say congratulations to you, your colleagues, the British Ministry of Defence and everyone involved. We appear to be one of the leading nations to the evacuation. So well done. Um, if you'll accept that it was perhaps a slightly sluggish start, what would you put the success later in the evacuation down to, Foreign Secretary? Good morning. Uh, Nick, good morning, and look, thank you for uh, thank you for saying. You've got what to call it said. the way it is. That's the truth behind the matter. That's the honesty of it. Well, thank you, and uh, look, having having accepted your praise, I'm going to slightly push back against the uh, the little bit of implied criticism there, because actually, we uh, I was coordinating uh, this evacuation. Uh, no, actually, that's not. I was coordinating with my French, German, and uh, other foreign ministerial colleagues. Uh, back when I was in Japan, right at the head of this, and we were looking at how we supported each other, uh, we put in place a large and complicated uh, operation, the planning of which uh, started before the ceasefire was uh, announced. Uh, so, you know, we, we, we started moving very, very quickly, but because of the scale and nature of the evacuation mission that we had to put in place, it was inevitably going to be uh, slightly slower in terms of its execution than in others. But we've been coordinating with our friends and colleagues around the world uh, from the very, very start on this. They have supported us. We have supported them. It's genuinely been an international team effort. But the hard work hasn't finished. Uh, we are still maintaining a presence in Port Sudan on the eastern edge of Sudan on the Red Sea. And we are also now continuing our thinking about what humanitarian support Sudan may need if this conflict drags on. So will more British citizens be or dual nationals be evacuated, Foreign Secretary? Well, what we have found increasingly now is as people use those land routes uh, to uh, Port Sudan, in many instances, they are they, they, they are less in need of an air evacuation from Sudan itself. There are a number of options at Port Sudan, including a ferry across to uh, Saudi Arabia. And I'd like to pay uh, a tribute to the Saudi authorities who've been working very, very closely uh, with us to facilitate that crossing of the Red Sea and the onward passage of British nationals uh, and others. So the nature will change. How we support British nationals and others will evolve. And in parallel to that, we are talking about what humanitarian support Sudan is going to need, whilst, of course, pushing for a permanent end to this conflict. So how much longer do you anticipate UK personnel being at Port Sudan? That's difficult to say, and it depends very much on circumstances and on need. We really hope that we will be able to kind of lock in this ceasefire, turn it into a permanent cessation of violence. If that uh, is the case, then I suspect that the need for our direct, assistment, uh, direct assistance in Sudan might also diminish, but we can't predict for sure. At the moment, we have a, um, uh, a warship uh, just off the coast of Port Sudan. We have a cross-Whitehall team of officials in Port Sudan to help uh, British nationals uh, leave the country. We can scale that up or indeed scale it down depending on circumstances. OK, now with nearly 2,200 people safely evacuated, I don't expect you to know the identity of every single one, but are you aware of the case that's received a lot of coverage of Samrin Idras, a three-year-old British girl who I read is currently still in Port Sudan. Again, I read British diplomat diplomats refusing to evacuate her and her Sudanese mother. Foreign Secretary. <laughs> So I've, I've, I've seen reports of this. What I don't have is the full details. And sometimes uh, the, the, the particulars of a, of a case make it more complicated than the headlines would suggest. So I'm aware of this. I don't know the full details. Our officials do have some dis, uh, degree uh, of uh, discretion, but I wouldn't like to second guess from afar decisions that they are making uh, on, the, on the ground because they're the ones that are in... Uh, full ownership of the facts but of course that, that that case has been raised with me and I will make sure that that is fed through the system just to ensure that if there is the opportunity to uh, support we take that opportunity. How much does the evacuation cost Foreign Secretary? So that I don't have the figure uh, at the at the moment of course you know, it has been a, uh, a long a complicated and resource intensive uh, operation. Mm. At some point in the future, of course, we'll have to let, total up how much okay. uh, this all costs, let, but, it let, won't, it be, but it will be a significant sum. Yes, indeed. 
I mean, you don't need reminding how busy you and your colleagues are, not just with the operation in Sudan. You've got the pressures in Ukraine, you've got the sanctions in Russia and everything else. And yet I read that the Foreign Office's building was the quietest, with just 40% of staff actually physically present. Are you happy with that number? So, Nick, I have, I have people working all around the world in all different time zones, uh, some from... Uh, government buildings mm-hmm. like King Charles Street, the yep. uh, the office where the uh, the Foreign Office. Some working from home, mm. some working from satellite phones and laptops in the middle of the desert. So mine has always been a geographically distributed uh, organisation. My view is that as long as the work is being done, and as you said at the top of this interview, in this instance we can see demonstrably the work is being done and done well. We're also planning. Uh, for the uh, ongoing support for Ukraine, also planning for uh, His Majesty's uh, coronation and the hosting of inward visitors. We do all these well, things in parallel, a few more people and we do work, them all though, over Mr. the world. Cleverly. Let's, let's worry so, about King Charles Street, not your great colleagues who are, as you say, on sat phones in the desert. Would it not be a good idea to have more than four in ten behind their desks in King Charles Street? Work is something you do, not somewhere you go. And the point is, my officials are working. We work in every time zone. We work in locations all around the world. If I thought that our output was uh, not at the level that I would require, I would make sure that it is. But as I say, what I've seen in this department is really top quality output in incredibly difficult circumstances. In a previous life, you served as Education Secretary, Mr Cleverly. What's your message to teachers today? The Joint Secretary of the NEU says that they seek to minimise disruption, her words, not mine, minimise disruption for our students who are taking GCSE uh, and A-levels. Your message to those teachers? Well, look, uh, I've... uh, in the short time, very short time I was education secretary, I think I had a, a good professional uh, relationship with the leaders of the uh, of the teaching unions. Uh, the best way of minimising disruption to students is for those teachers to be in the classrooms. Um, many, many students have had a very, very disruptive last couple of, disrupted last couple of years because of COVID. Um, and I think everything that we can do to help them start their uh, lives um, uh, better through education is really, really important. We, of course, listen to the concerns of the teachers and the teaching union, but ultimately, you know, these kids have been through a tough enough time as it is, and I'd really, really hope that uh, those uh, teachers who you know I know have the best interests of those students at heart focus on that um, and uh, accept that the, uh, the offer that's been put forward, including a reduction in their workload because over and over again I was told it's not just about the money, it's about the level of workload. We're reducing the level of workload, reducing the hours uh, that they are committed to and I really hope they recognise this is a good offer uh, and they get back to where they can be most useful which is in the classroom supporting young people. Last couple of questions. How surprised were you by the story in one of your newspapers today that Sue Gray held secret talks with Sir Keir Starmer while working for the team advising the Commons party gate. Nick, I'm not, I'm not picking up on that. I can't quite hear you. Let me try again. Can you, can you hear me now, Foreign Secretary? Do you hear me any better now, Mr Cleverly? No? We've lost Mr Cleverly. We'll try one last time. Mr. Let's just, if you can hold one last time. Mr Cleverly, let's try one last time because it is a, quite a good question. Can you hear me now, Mr Cleverly? Oh, yes. I've got you back again. Have you got yeah, me, now sir? I've got you back. James Cleverly, can you hear me, sir? Yes, you went quiet for a second. Uh, I, I don't know. <laughs> That's a rarity. I just did one more minute. Say, I, was, I was quite shocked. <laughs> yes, indeed. Um, uh, as How surprised were you, uh, Mr Cleverly, when you saw a report in today's paper, Sue Gray held secret talks with Sir Keir Starmer while working for the team advising the Commons Partygate investigation into uh, your long ally, of course, long-standing ally, former Prime Minister Boris Johnson. How surprised were you by that, Mr Cleverly? Uh, very. Uh, so this report is by ACOBA, which is the independent body. So it's completely independent of uh, the government. Uh, it's an independent report and it looks into senior appointments of uh, uh, politicians and senior civil servants. So I've not seen the report. Uh, I've seen that speculation about what is in it, if that turns out to be the case. I do think there are some very, very serious questions that need to be answered. Such as? Um, well, I mean, it strikes me, look, again, I don't want to speculate because I've not seen the report, but ultimately, uh, when someone is uh, involved with such a sensitive matter as that, whilst also 
having conversations with someone that would obviously benefit directly from any damage to the Prime Minister. I mean, that demands uh, serious questions be answered. As I say, I've not seen the report. This may prove to be inaccurate speculation, but if it is accurate, I think Keir Starmer has got some very, very serious questions to answer. Thank you for bearing with us through a, a fading line. Congratulations to you and your team with what you've achieved in Sudan. Foreign Secretary James Cleverly appearing here on LBC. It's one minute after eight. Let's get the headlines. Thomas Watts. On your radio, on Global Player and... Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation. This is LBC. From Global's newsroom, thousands of teachers are beginning another day